and welcome back to Traditionally Speaking. Now, as you know, it's always Christmas at Traditionally Speaking, all the year round, but welcome in this particular occasion to our Christmas special, our December episode, where Joe and I are going to be talking about that most famous of festive poems, A Visit from St Nicholas. <laughs> and I have been waiting for this one. Ah, oh, I'm so excited about this and I, you know, I hope everybody can can put up with my enthusiasm and excitement on this. This has been oh, the, the, the one thing I've wanted to discuss ever since Tom and I first talked about this, but there's a lot I'll bet that most people don't know about a visit from St. Nicholas, otherwise known as the night before Christmas. Um, of course, everybody I think knows, or most people do, that it was written by um, Clement Clark Moore, um, and that it, it has just basically defined what Santa Claus and what um, uh, Christmas is all about. It's given us the names of the reindeer and a lot of different things, but one of the things, and I am so proud to announce this to everybody, is it is celebrating its bicentennial year. It was written 200 years ago in 1822. I mean, that, that's just huge. And, and it was actually penned and given to his daughters by, by Moore um, on December 24th of 1822. So Tom, 200 years. Do you know, isn't it incredible? Because you wonder when Clement Clark Moore first put his pen to paper all those years ago, if he could ever have imagined the incredible influence that this poem would have. Um, I mean, it's not only the most famous poem to deal with Christmas. Some have said it's actually one of the most influential pieces of American verse ever written. High compliment indeed. Uh, I was looking at my notes and thinking how he has influenced other people that have given us our, our view of Santa Claus, including Thomas Nast and Haddon Sunbloom, who did the Coca-Cola Santa for all those years, both stole off of basically Clement Moore's poem and his description of Santa Claus. So, <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the amazing thing is Moore based his Santa Claus figure on basically a portly Dutch handyman that he met while he was out shopping for a turkey for his family. And that was his inspiration while he was in the sleigh to start penning this perfect poem to describe Christmas in a nutshell. So <laughs> what do you got on this, Tom? Well, I mean, little could that chap have known that he was going to be immortalized forevermore. Um, and yet, as you say, the influence has been immeasurable. Um, I mean, right throughout the 19th century, um, the poem was read and I mean, it has entertained people here in Scotland every bit as much as it has in the USA. Um, Which is amazing because there aren't a lot of things that affect our two countries quite as much as this one poem. And, and not just obviously Scotland and the USA, but all around the world, I mean, I can't tell you how many variations there are, how many uh, artisans have, have taken to illustrating this and um, how many versions there are. And of course, that's even changed through the years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, I know it's a topic we're going to discuss in more detail later, um, but uh, if you look at the early silent Christmas movies um, of the late 19th and early 20th century, um, it says everything that the, the first silent Christmas movie to be made in the USA um, and then the very first silent Christmas movie to be made in the United Kingdom uh, both adapted the, uh, the central premise of Clement Clark Moore's poem. Um, that amazing sequence where we discover how Santa Claus comes to visit every Christmas Eve and uh, we learn about how he comes down the chimney to deliver parcels, that kind of thing. Um, I didn't it's, know that. That's, those were the very first Christmas movies? Yeah, absolutely. And you can still see the British one on YouTube. 
Um, although I think the original American one was lost simply because of the format it was on. Um, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to look into that, to be honest. But um, we can, I think that's possibly a discussion where we could, we could look at all of those early uh, proto-Christmas movies, but it says everything that that was the moment, wasn't it, where it really started. You know, it was that um, focus on Santa Claus and the joy that he brings um, that has come to typify festive movie making. Well, it doesn't surprise me that you would know this, Tom. You've written several fabulous books on Christmas movies, so you're my Christmas movie go-to expert on anything having to do with Christmas and film. So, <laughs> but thank you for sharing. Boy, I did not know that. And, you know, one of the things that was interesting was when Moore wrote this, the reason why he made it Christmas Eve is there was a... a big controversy going on between the Protestants and the Catholics over celebrating uh, Christmas Day and having it being a big holiday. And the Protestants were not in favor of that. So what he did is rather than get in the middle of this controversy, he sidestepped it by talking about Santa arriving Christmas Eve. And that actually started our Christmas Eve celebrations all those 200 years ago. And that, you know, they were already hanging stockings, but then that obviously popularized that and led to, you know, other things like the, the, the reindeer, of course, Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donner, and Blitzen, which by the way, here's another little tidbit. The original reindeer names we're not Donner and Blitzen. It was actually Dunder and Blixem. So, which is actually out of the old Dutch translation. Uh, and then Dunder became um, uh, Donder. And then later on, Donder was changed to Donner. So it's gone through a couple different variations and Blixem of course became Blitzen. And Donner and Blitzen actually means thunder and lightning in uh, German translation. So that's how we got our modern day Donner and Blitzen. So it, it's just amazing the things that he's affected by writing that one little poem, which is less than 500 words. Yeah, and you know, that's the astonishing thing because he was a remarkable figure, Clement Clark Moore. He was a, a professor of Oriental and Greek literature. And he was someone who had a you know, very significant body of original research behind him. Um, so it says everything uh, about the influence of a visit from St. Nicholas, that that's the thing that we remember. You know, I mean, for all his contribution to his field uh, in his lifetime, uh, it's the poem and its vast influence um, that has continued to typify uh, his literary heritage. Yeah, in fact, when he penned it in 1822, he did not actually take authorship on that uh, until, well, it was 1837 when um, uh, they first gave his name to the poem, the authorship, but it wasn't until, I believe it was 1842 when it went into his book of poems that he actually claimed it for himself uh, in public. And, and that was at the urging of his kids. I mean, he literally wrote this poem for his two daughters, one of them being bedridden at the time and had asked him to pen something for her for Christmas. So that's how this kind of came around and he had been thinking about it. And like I said, when he was riding around in that sleigh with that Dutchman, he kind of started to, to put it in his head on how to write it. But as you said, his He's most noted on, on a scholarly uh, fashion for uh, his compendium of the uh, Hebrew language, which was a two volume tome that is still, he's still not even known for this, this day, but that, that's what he was. He was a professor of, of uh, Hebrew language. Yeah, and uh, I think by all accounts, quite a modest sort of individual. Um, so you can only imagine how he would have felt having written uh, the poem all those uh, decades ago um, to think that one day you would have things like Tom and Jerry cartoons or sort of <laughs> a, a visit from St. Nicholas. Uh, you know, and I'll tell you, I think that's one of the reasons why he didn't claim authorship 
right away is because he didn't, you know, he was trying to be very serious about his work. And this to him was a, basically a bit of fluff that he wrote for his kids and not something that he wanted to be remembered for at the time. I wonder how he feels about it now, but anyway. But it did, of course, cause a controversy of who the actual author is because he did wait so long to, to claim authorship. And uh, well, you know about obviously Major Henry Livingston Jr. Why don't you uh, enlighten our guests on that? Yeah, because um, Henry Livingston Jr. was a, a New Yorker and um, someone who had Scottish roots actually, um, but he also had Dutch family. And as a result, some literary scholars thought you know, this made him possibly a, a kind of plausible author or perhaps co-author. There has been a, a great deal of uh, debate uh, over over this, but I think generally speaking, many, um, and I would say almost certainly a majority uh, of, uh, of literary scholars and, and linguistic analysts uh, have agreed that, um, you know, Clement Clark Moore is the plausible author in the sense that there doesn't seem to be any um, existing literature or documentation to suggest otherwise. Yeah, there's um, really no empirical evidence. Um, anyway, and I'm not taking anything away from Livingston. And, you know, obviously I'm a, I'm a little uh, biased about, you know, the, the gentleman being named Moore, but, <laughs> but and even his daughter, um, Mary Moore Ogden, uh, did the first illustrations on the book before any others uh, appeared. So, which also kind of points toward the fact that it was probably written by Moore. So, and, you know, I'm, there are factions in both camps, and I think it can kind of go either way on this, but uh, I'm going to stick with the uh, more popular view that Moore wrote the, the poem. And I think, it, you know, he's Certainly, he wrote four handwritten illustrations, the last one going for in the hundreds of thousands of dollars at auction. Um, so I'm going to kind of stick with that and just go, there's more empirical evidence that more wrote it than there was for Livingston. Yeah, very much so. And, and I think it's probably important to mention as well that uh, Livingston was distantly related to Moore's wife. Um, you know, so there was that kind of connection there. And I think there probably, if there was any real contestation of um, of Moore's authorship, it probably would have surfaced by now. So I think most people are quite happy just to accept Clement Clark Moore as the author of the poem. But it is amazing. I mean, again, today we base so much of our visualization of Santa Claus and uh, coming the night before Christmas and delivering the gifts and filling the stockings and all the things that are associated with Santa over the years. And obviously uh, there is almost no country that doesn't celebrate some version of Santa Claus. And while he does dress differently in some countries and he does do different things and arrives differently, um, there's still no question that uh, Clement Clark Moore's poem has influenced more people on how we um, decorate and celebrate Christmas today than any other figure I can think of in history. I mean, and I think there's a shared cultural nostalgia for this poem as well, because so many of us um, remember growing up with it. Um, I know that my uh, my co-director at Extremist Publishing, Julie, my, my sister, uh, she read it to me when I was just a little little child. And, you know, for that reason, you still remember these things with great nostalgia. Absolutely. In fact, that's, you know, again, 200 years. Now, I, I talk about 200 years as it being penned. It was officially published initially on December 23rd of 1823, by the Troy Sentinel newspaper. So that was its first official publication uh, where it made an appearance in the public. Um, and, it, and there was no author assigned to it at that time because they didn't know who wrote it. Uh, it had been passed on from somebody in either Moore's family or one of his servants or somebody, a friend 
uh, to the Troy newspaper. And that's when they published it. And as I said, you know, after that, the rest is history. But, um, but quite honestly, but the fact is that it was originally penned 200 years ago this year. That's amazing. So, so we got this bicentennial and next year's as the official publication. So, <laughs> but yeah, and really even right down to the way he is dressed and stuff, like I said, affected people like Thomas Nast and he based his uh, Mary St. Nicholas painting. And he admits that he basically took that from Moore's uh, poem. And, you know, isn't it amazing to think of the many different forms that that poem has taken now? I mean, whether it's set to music or, um, you know, orchestral versions, as you sometimes see, or or even stage versions, you know, it, it still continues to capture people's imagination even now. Well, and there, you know, as you said, many, many variations and for different reasons, too. I mean, there's been some people have had a lot of fun taking his basic rhyme and rhythm and you know using it in different uh, subjects and, and different things and i'm not going to get into them because i'm not going to give uh, credence to any of those right now uh save one there is a new book out called and what is it tom the I christmas eve journey <laughs> <laughs> and that's penned by another more and that would be me <laughs> <laughs> I took, uh, I took, you know, um, this wonderful poem and, and not changed it so much as brought, brought it in from a new point of view from Santa's point of view, and basically wrote about Santa's version of the night before Christmas, and talk about you know, how the effect was on the family and the dad that met him. So, and uh, how did you put it, Tom? I... Yes, uh, uh, that's a really remarkable thing, isn't it, Joe, about your story? Because it's written in the, the Japanese Gaiden style, um, in the sense that it's neither a prequel nor a sequel, but a story that takes place at exactly the same time as the, the story that we know and love, but uh, telling the opposite side of that story seeing it from Santa's point of view. And it's told in the same amount of words, the same uh, rhythm, the same uh, cadence, the same everything, except as Tom said, a different point of view. And I, I gotta say, I'm very pleased with the um, comments that I've, that I've gotten from so many people already on this. And I'm hoping that maybe someday my name will be celebrated along with Clements. So. <laughs> <laughs> and my Mary Moore, uh, my lovely wife, is the one that illustrated this and did a phenomenal job. Absolutely gorgeous. And I'll tell you, it's, you can certainly go on the website at uh, uh, www.northpolepress.com and see it. And uh, maybe we'll even have a picture up on the website here so you can, uh, and a quick way to get to that. But yeah, and I just love that poem so much. And I know, like Tom said, his older sister, Julie, used to read it to him. Well, my parents read it to me and has always made such a, a perfect impact. And I think it had a lot to do with me portraying Santa Claus in my later years, <laughs> which I've been doing for 20 years now. So Anyway, but yeah, it, it's just such a fabulous poem and it's written so beautifully. And, you know, the fun part with mine is that it is a little bit more modern language. So people aren't going to wonder about what the down of a thistle looks like or, you know, mon or kerchief and I in my cap kind of thing. <laughs> a little more modern than that. Yeah, well, being Scottish, I can guarantee you immediately with no a thistle if you stood on one um, because they're here in great abundance <laughs> well and you know as it, as with all things i mean you stop and think about you know what took place 200 years ago and one you know several of the things that are in that poem that aren't 
you wouldn't find today necessarily. So, and certainly some of the language and stuff. And of course, the reference to tobacco is is gone now out of almost every version um, of both Clement Clark's version and of course mine. So, you know, there's been some things where we've tried to update it and keep it alive. And I think that's part of the wonder of this is you can make subtle changes like changing the reindeer names. And, you know, it, and it's still just as valid and just as important as it was, you know, 175 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I would warmly recommend that anyone out there um, pick up a copy of the Christmas Eve journey, uh, because anyone who perhaps was curious to find out what was going through Santa's head when he visited that family all those years ago, um, they can find out with these beautiful colour illustrations, you know, with lovely bold tones. Uh, it just it brings the whole story alive. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that immensely. So what's, I'd like to find out from our listeners, what are some of their earliest recollections about the night before Christmas? How old were you when you first uh, came across this poem, and in what form did uh, did one of your family read it to you? Did you happen to stumble across it in the library? Did you pick it up in a bookstore? I, you know, this thing has grown legs and gone all over the world, and it'd be fun to find out how a lot of people discovered this. Um, and I, boy, I'd love to post some of the th the things that. Uh, some of the replies we get, because I'll bet you they're going to be as varied and, and as interesting as the poem itself. And of course, this is what traditionally speaking is all about. The last 200 years, we have been, you know, celebrating Santa Claus and his arrival at, at Christmas time. And it's certainly one of the happiest moments of most people's lives. And this is you know, to me, you couldn't get more traditional than than uh, a visit uh, from St. Nicholas. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, everything that we know about the modern Santa all starts there. And that's the really amazing thing, isn't it? Because so many different countries have their own take on Santa and what he does and how he does it. Um, but it's nice to know that so many people have a shared positive memory of this poem and how it started to bring the whole story of Santa alive to so many people. And absolutely. And by the way, obviously, we are going to talk in greater detail and much more about some of Santa's travels and how he gets around and, you know, how he shows up in different countries and stuff on later podcasts. I mean, that's certainly going to be in our lineup because there is so many interesting ways in which Santa appears in different countries. And a lot of countries are just starting to, to start this tradition themselves, and especially some of the Asian countries and some of the countries down the Southern hemisphere. So, and of course we're borrowing from uh, other countries as well. And some of the things they're doing like uh, Christmas in July, uh, we're borrowing from the Australians. So, it's fun to think about all the different ways that Santa does appear, and you're going to find it fascinating how some of these uh, came about. Uh, the traditional U.S. version basically came out of Sinterklaas, uh, which is a Dutch version. So that's kind of the way it started, and it, it's fitting that uh, Clement Clark Moore wrote this because he was up in New York. And, you know, that's kind of where Santa made his first appearance in the U.S. Yes, because isn't that often said that, you know, one of the really the, the best things about Christmas is that it brings people together. And what brings people together more than having all of these different traditions, including traditions of Santa, um, where people can compare their own views on it, you know, their own culture, what they grew up with at Christmas, uh, and, and compare them, you know, and talk about what was important to them. And absolutely. And we invite our listeners to also, you know, again, tell us your earliest memories of Santa Claus and how you were introduced to it. Was it through Clement Clark Moore's poem or was it something else? I mean, did you go to a department store when you were five and that was your first uh, meeting of Santa Claus and learning about him? Or did you 
find out a different way. I, you know, I love hearing different people's stories and their experiences, and they're as varied and as fascinating as the tradition itself. There is a song over here, Santa's a Scotsman, um, which uh, explains <laughs> not only that Santa's very fond of, uh, you know, iron brew and all the other Scottish <laughs> festive treats, but that uh, he may he may possibly have a thing for Eccleffec and tarts as well, and that's something we discuss, <laughs> that's something we might discuss in a later podcast. Well, um, without getting too deep into it. He does get a few beverages of his choice, uh, you know, as he travels around the world. And it's not all milk. <laughs> anyway, well, I'll tell you, if anybody has some interesting uh, information that they want to share over and above what we've talked about here, I again, I invite you to join us at our website and, and, and send us something at www.traditionally-speaking.com. <laughs> and we'll be glad to, to post it. And, you know, if you have some other information, I'd love to share it with our listeners. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we're not far away from Christmas now. So uh, on behalf of Joe and myself, I'd like to wish you all a very happy and safe Christmas. Uh, we hope wherever you are, um, whether it's on either side of the Atlantic or further afield, that you have a wonderful festive season and a really happy new year when the time comes. And I just have to add, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. I hope that you'll come back and join us again next year, where it's going to be Christmas every episode at all times of the year with Traditionally Speaking. <laughs>